Welcome from Glasgow. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are it's in the world. So welcome also to the audience here. It's a true pleasure also to facilitate also this uh, initial remarks. Um, my name is uh, Holger Daltmann and I work for the Climate Compatible Growth uh, Program and the uh, Transport Lead there. So we will have this afternoon, and can you go with the next slide, please? Um, we, will, we will have uh, three sessions this afternoon, and I will share that in a, in a, in a, in a minute. So this is all to get today is about decarbonizing transport. Next slide, please. We heard us in uh, the last two days out of COP that first really commitments came up around methane, around the sort of deforestation. But what we see also here in this slide is in fact also there is a need to tackle transport. Currently also the scenarios from International Energy Agency, from ITF telling us if we not also tackle as a transport, we go from nine gigatons to almost 18 in a business as usual. But science is also telling us First, we have to go down also to two to three gigatons. So a massive amount of work needs to be done now. It's urgent. So, so therefore, so we need also to discuss also what are the opportunity here. Next slide, please. The second not so good news so far is uh, countries coming also to Glasgow with less ambition on transport. And here is a slide um, provided us by uh, GIZ, just as it came up with the latest analysis saying, well, the vast majority of us are the uh, long-term strategies and also the national action plans, so the NDCs are not having a sectoral target and are also lacking also of the ambition at the same time. So look also at that research as well. So it's it's crucial that we also bring also that up. Next slide, please. And finally, this is the Climate Compatible Growth Program, particular focuses on also transport and the link to energy, which is absolutely crucial to so decarbonize as transport. So currently, uh, transport uh, consumes around 32% of the global fuel consumption but only 3.1% is in fact is out of renewables. And here, so the green renewables are also for electricity, when we talk about electromobility in a minute, is only 0.3. So there is a need also for really also ramping up and looking particularly into the nexus. At the same time, we should not forget about also transport is not just about decarbonization. We have to make it just transition to bring also everyone in. So the access also for all, is absolutely crucial. Next one. And with that, also, I'm very pleased also to introduce us our three sessions also for today, the whole afternoon. We will start also with the launch of the hybrid development and management model. And it's uh, in the partnership with our sister program funded also uh, by FCDO, the high volume transport program. I'm really pleased also to have uh, Bernard here um, and then also we will follow up with directly with uh, rebalancing the electromobility debate. So the question is how we can also bring also the transition to uh, um, an opportunity for electric mobility for all in also the global south and what is needed. And this is a partnership with a sustainable mobility for all partnership. Um, and then finally, as we talk about money, so we will have a session together in partnership with the Asian Development Bank on making integrated electromobility and renewable energy finance work. So, uh, so please also join us. Um, fun slide. And uh, you also have the opportunity, also, as you currently are on a Zoom call, you can also join us also on that live stream also later on. So again, also, thanks also for joining and um, looking forward to the discussion. And now it's handing over also to uh, Bernard Obike. Bernard is the team leader for the High Volume Transport Program. And uh, I'd like to hand over to you, Bernard. Thank you very much, Holger and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, first session on the transport afternoon here at, the, at this event, um, which is the session on the launch of the highway development and maintenance models 
under a new multi-donor trust fund. My name is Bernard Obika, as Holger has said. Um, I lead the High Volume Transport Applied Research Program, which is funded by the FCDO and managed at IMC Worldwide. The High Volume Transport Applied Research Program is a five-year program focused on improving transport systems for low and middle-income countries of Africa and South Asia. So uh, let us begin. We will have five presentations this afternoon or evening or night, depending on where you are around the world. Um, the first speaker is Martin Humphreys, who joins us from the Washington DC. Martin is a global lead for transport, connectivity, and regional integration at the World Bank. Martin has been with the bank for over 18 years, worked in a number of regions, uh, advising on transport modes, policies, and strategies. Martin has a, uh, his doctorate from University of Leeds Institute of Transport. Martin, if I can hand over to you to deliver your presentation. Great, thank you very much, Bernard. And, uh... Um, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is joining us today. I'm going to wait one moment until um, Katie brings up my presentation, and then we'll get starting. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about greening and updating uh, the highway development and, and management model. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. Um, just to give you a very quick overview of what I'm going to say. I'm going to give a little background for those people who aren't aware of what the, uh, the highway development management model is. I'll give you a, a very short history, uh, though it's actually a quite a long um, and illustrious history, uh, why we need to change it. And, and obviously, um, decarbonization is a crucial part of that. Uh, the proposed approach uh, that we have agreed with a core group of, of stakeholders, and then what we see as the immediate next steps. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. So let's start with, with what the highway development and management model is. Uh, next slide, slide, please, Katie. And in its simplest form, um, and I'm going to refer to it as HDMM, it's version four in its latest iteration, is actually a, a software package and the associated documentation, the manuals uh, and training um, for road authorities around the world to essentially um, undertake the analysis, planning, management, and appraisal of road maintenance improvements and investment decisions on the road network. It allows a road authority in a country to undertake both the strategic level analysis uh, for its entire primary road network, or sometimes it's the primary and the secondary, um, for a long-term period under different budget scenarios, and allows them to investigate different levels of service consistent with uh, the projected budget and the associated maintenance strategy. It also allows with slightly more information um, that same road authority to conduct what a one to three year, one to five year uh, development plan, maintenance plan for the network um, to uh, identify in more granularity and with more certainty over the costs, uh, the actual recurrent activities that are required to maintain uh, the network at the defined level of service. And then we go down to the third level of service, um, sorry, the third level of uh, activities within the program, and that's the project level analysis, where in its simplest term, it allows a road authority to investigate uh, different options to upgrade a particular link in the network um, and get uh, the economic internal rate of return and the net present value for those different options and, and hopefully identify the one against a, a defined uh, base case. Next slide, please, Katie. How does it do this? Well, it essentially relies on the calculation of the structural performance of the pavement and looks at the, the life cycle of the deterior deterioration of that pavement, uh, given a defined maintenance regime, uh, given uh, defined interventions um, and climatic variation. Um, it looks at how road user costs and benefits change uh, given that uh, 
given that deterioration over the over a defined appraisal period and comes up with an economic comparison of the different project alternatives. Currently, I think 67 countries around the world hold the license for the software. And it's seen possibly in terms of the brand as commercially independent and certainly considerably cheaper than some of the, uh, some of the proprietary alternatives that can be used as part of an asset management system in a road authority around the world. Around the world. It's, it's also been um, for almost since its inception, a, a prerequisite to the provision of finance to the client countries of the World Bank and a number of other MDBs and, and bilaterals. And just to give you an indication of, of the scale um, and the potential impact on the importance of, of the highway development management model in relation to the portfolio of the bank, we currently have 162 active transport projects in our portfolio. That amounts to just over 30 billion US dollars of which approximately 20 billion are connectivity related, and that's essentially interurban and rural roads. Now, um, HDM4 in its latest version would have been involved in the appraisal of pretty much every road that is included within that portfolio. And going forward over the next three years, our pipeline is another $18 billion. And although we don't actually know until the project is approved, uh, how it's going to be coded, the expectation is that, you know, at least 50% of that, 40% of that will be again on connectivity on primary and secondary and tertiary road networks. Next slide, please, uh, Katie. So let me just give you a very short history um, and explain why we're getting to the point we are at the moment. Next slide, please, Katie. Um, the original uh, uh, idea for uh, HDM was the need to come up with a consistent model uh, to appraise investment in, in the road network across client countries. And it was done jointly to a certain extent by the World Bank in, in conjunction with uh, the Transport and Road Research Laboratory starting in about 1968. Um, this resulted in the first iteration, which was the highway cost model, came out in 1971, which was, I think, a considerable advance over the other models that were used for examining interactions between road work costs and, and construction costs. There was then a, a major period, a field study undertaken in Kenya over a four year period by the same partners, which led to on the side of TRL, the road transport investment model uh, for developing countries, which came out in 1977 and the highway cost model, which evolved into the highway design and maintenance standard model in 1979. And that was the original HDM1 both of these were based on a mainframe at the time. Uh, there was additional work in subsequent years looking at the impact of climatic variation on pavement deterioration. Um, and that led to the uh, development of what we call the RTIM2 model and essentially HDM3, which came out in 1987. These were now PC based. Um, they were written in uh, C++, I think in, in, uh, in the case of HDM3. And then there was further uh, development um, and anybody who's been as around, around as long as some of us on the panel will remember the difficulty of working with HDM3 and its punch card format, but that was a small digression um, where it was the time required was, was not uh, an inconsequential amount in order to prepare it to appraise a road project. There was further iterations which led to the development of uh, HDM PC, HDM Q and HDM Manager in 1994, um, which improved the user interface and certainly reduced the amount of time and improved the user friendliness of, of the HDM model. Still at this time called the Highway Design and Maintenance Standard Model. Next slide, please, Katie. By 1993, I think these models were in extensive use. And I think there was recognition at that time that the sort of extensive research that had been undertaken over the previous 10 years, uh, together with their increasing use in, in developed countries, uh, not just in, in, uh, in less developing countries, um, this includes Australia, um, some American states, and, and certainly South Africa at the time had started to make use of the models, resulted in the need for additional uh, capabilities to be introduced. So in 1973, uh, the International Study of Highway Development and Management Tools, ISO HDM, was set up uh, to essentially extend the scope of HDM through and, and produce an improved tool for the development of the economic and technical strategies in, in the road sector. Next slide, please, Katie. 
This led ultimately, and, and there's a little bit of duplication here in my slides, and I do apologize. This led ultimately to the development of HDM4, and the name changed at this particular point in time to the Highway Development and Management Tool, reflecting you know, the greater functionality um, of the model. And, and version one of that came out in 1999, version two in 2005. And unfortunately, since 2005, despite, uh, again, extensive research and despite uh, considerable needs, uh, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of development since that point. And we're at the point at the moment we we need to sit back and essentially engage in a in a reflection that will result in the next substantive step forward in, in the highway design and management model. Next slide, please, Katie. So what's 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 driving the need for change? Next slide, please, Katie. Well, um, I think crucially, uh, most one of the weaknesses in, in the highway development and management model at the moment is estimates of network resilience and criticality within the network is not one of the core criteria in at any of the levels, uh, whether at the, uh, at the strategic level, whether at the, the work planning level, or whether at the project level. And certainly within the World Bank, what we've tried to do is come up with um, parallel estimates of, of criticality within a road network and then overlay them on a, a strategy analysis undertaken by HDM4. It's not ideal. Um, similarly, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, again, not a core criteria in terms of the, uh, the decision criteria within HDM4, within the model. Um, within the World Bank, again, we've been looking to develop uh, what we call, forgive the pun, end of tailpipe models. So we take the output from HDM4 and then we'll run it to an Excel space, space spreadsheet in order to come up with an estimate of GHG emissions from the different options and feed it back in. Doesn't always work well and certainly probably isn't adhered to by many of the road authorities in our client countries. Um, equally, road safety benefits. Um, Although they are included within the model, it's probably fair to say that um, the, they could be brought forward in a slightly more central role. And I think that's crucial given the economic and social costs of, of road traffic crashes in, in our client countries, and indeed in, in the majority of the countries um, that the MDBs work in around the world. There are, have been for some time problems with the way the value of time and the value of life are dealt with within the model. Uh, there's no allowance within the model to um, within it uh, to allow for indexation, uh, so a growth in the real value of life and time. Uh, we tend to have to do it manually then put an average back in. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the model was written in C++, but it was written for a PC-based platform. Um, and I think there is considerable scope and it would be far stronger if we move to a, a cloud-based model that would allow uh, potentially uh, the centralization of the data from the model and analysis on the data across regions within regions that would provide a tremendous amount of value in terms of comparators to road authorities and, and countries that we have only just begun to explore and traditionally we've always had difficulty collecting in a robust uh, manner even to the point of you know comparing uh, unique costs for road interventions across countries for instance um, second to last uh, tertiary roads. Um, at the moment, you know, HCM4 allows us to look primarily at the primary and secondary road network. Tertiary roads have generally been handled for a number of reasons by a different model in the bank. It's the red model. And, and I think it's possible in, in terms of the, um, the way that HDM could be extended now is to allow it to cover all levels of, of the road network um, outside urban areas. I think it's probably fair to say. And then finally, you know, the current license period runs out in July next year. And this was seen as a very opportune time in, in order to look at, um, you know, a different institution model, uh, put it possibly on a, on a slightly more sustainable uh, footing that would result in an in incremental development going forward that would uh, negate the need uh, to, to come back and return with significant investment to, uh, to, to engender a further upgrade in 10 or 15 years time. Next slide, please, Katie. So how do we propose to do this? Next slide, please, Katie. We, 
um, there was a small group of um, <clears throat> stakeholders, um, ourselves, um, the FCDO, uh, ADB, uh, together with the existing stakeholders within HTM4, I think that relied very heavily on the work done by Bernard Pika, AMC Worldwide, and Hodas Media under the high volume transport uh, program of the FCDO. Um, which did an initial business plan, um, looked at the advantages and disadvantages of the model, uh, looked at the potential for the model going forward, um, and I think made a substantive input and identified a pathway um, for uh, the development of the model. Um, it was suggested uh, that the World Bank take on the leadership of this, given the scope of the organization. And from our side, I think the administrative vehicle uh, that we proposed to use was uh, a new facility to decarbonize transport uh, that has just recently been set up within the World Bank. Aspiration of that, of course, is um, that we will have um, a delivery modality for catalytic funding to formulate, innovate, and scale up support to client countries to decarbonize transport and build resilience whilst meeting their growing mobility needs. Um, and obviously, improved road network planning management from resilience central. Uh, to a low carbon transport system. So from our side, the, the GFTT is the vehicle that will handle the flow of funds necessary to invest in the upgrading, extending, piloting, and rolling out of, of HTM, what we call here HTMM version five, uh, a notional title that I've given it. And, and forgive, forgive my, uh, my prescription. Next slide, please. In terms of the governance structure, um, under, I think it's fair to say, the administrative structure that would normally be used to oversee trust fund monies within the World Bank, the proposal is that we will have a small steering committee um, comprised of core members. We'll have a project management team that will be based in Washington DC at the World Bank. And then we will have contributors and technical advisors who will contribute both to the project management but also more importantly, to the work streams under each of the areas. And you can anticipate um, that those work streams are gonna be focusing on things like initially, um, I suspect uh, the, the technical platform, uh, the move from C++ potentially and a PC based model to a cloud based system um, with parallel work streams on road safety potentially wider economic benefits, maybe, and I know Joe's going to talk about a little bit about those in his presentation, uh, the inclusion of tertiary roads, network resilience, um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, all in parallel that would feed back into the work done by uh, essentially the, uh, the group, the technical IT group. There would also be a work stream on governance and the institutional model, and that's probably one of the earlier ones that will be settled. Um, but I'm, I'm, there's a degree of conjecture here now because what we propose to do essentially is have an agenda that lays out uh, a timeline uh, consistent with the funding that is raised from interested stakeholders and participants um, in the first steering committee meeting, which we're hoping to hold uh, before the end of this calendar year. Next slide, please, Katie. As I mentioned, you know, we are, um, reliant and very thankful uh, for the, uh, the good work done under FCDO's HVT program, um, IMC Worldwide and HODAS Media. Um, the work, as I mentioned, included a review of the need and perspective of the clients, most importantly, gave us an indication of the potential improvements in the outline business case. Estimated cost um, was, I think, four to six million dollars. I put three to five in here. Um, but I think we would probably err on the side, on the conservative side. And that includes you know, technical improvements, platform changes, piloting, training, and the rollout. And you know, we would anticipate that that rollout is gonna take you know, a couple of years, um, even with the 67 countries we have at the moment, and that's after the piloting, uh, potentially. Now, we have initial funding from the World Bank, uh, FCDO, and PIAC, um, committed from, from PIAC. Um, and we have other commitments so far uh, to provide contributions in parallel or in kind from uh, ADB, um, the Climate Compatible Growth Program, and indeed SANRAL, given the extensive work that they've done on developing uh, HDM4 for the South African uh, context. 
out of the, the four to six million dollars, we have, uh, together with a commitment that was received yesterday for half a million dollars over three years, we are now close to one million dollars, um, which is, I think, a substantive start. And we'll be looking to put together the first uh, annual work plan and present it to the steering group um, probably uh, late November, early December. Next slide, please, Katie. So what are the next steps? Next slide, please, Katie. Well, we are engaged, as you heard from my last remark, in a sort of an active um, discussion to uh, interest all potential stakeholders, and that's MDBs, bilaterals, and others, to solicit further funding. Um, I'm, I'm quite candid in saying that, you know, if you want to join the steering committee, that, that really depends on the amount, the size that you bring to the, the size of the slice you bring to the cake. Um, uh, there are obviously some core stakeholders who've, who've invested a considerable amount of money over the last 30 years in this and, and have also been uh, strong supporters of it. And so I think the three chairs are certainly taken. Uh, anybody else, it's, it's essentially dependent on, on what you bring us and on, and that would also hold true for possibly the chairs of the working committees as well, but that's to be agreed at the steering committee level. The GFTT itself has been formally established and administration agreements, uh, and this is the essentially the legal agreement that we have between the World Bank and potential donors has been prepared. And I think one, the first ones will be sent out. So the one to FCDO will go out probably in the course of the next week. And then once that's been agreed, signed, and approved on both sides, um, then we issue a call of funds to start collecting the money. So we would expect the money to start coming in for this particular activity over the course of the next two to three weeks. In parallel, uh, we have started the preparation of the annual, uh, the initial annual business plan. And uh, again, as I said, that's gonna be shared with steering committee members ahead of a first meeting in the late fall of 2021. Next slide, please, Katie. Now in the work of IMC Worldwide and HODIS Media, um, within the business plan that I mentioned, which was admittedly a high level plan, they had laid out a sort of simple schematic of next steps. And you can see, you know, given the license expires um, July 2022, um, they had essentially aspired to get everything in place by uh, 2022. I think realistically now, when I look at this, um, and again, subject to the discussion with the steering committee, this is probably unlikely to be held. We're probably looking at a, a transitional period of, of 18 to 24 months on the end of that uh, to be agreed with stakeholders. And we're probably gonna be looking, given the way the funding is coming in, um, at rather than establishing the new organizational structure up front, uh, doing that um, further down, uh, and so the, uh, the chair and, and the focus of the initial activities will be on the platform and the technical work streams and we'll do the institutional model in parallel. So at some point, you know, before the end of the transitional period, uh, the new institutional structure will be established and put in place. And I would guess at that point, we'll be looking to hire, you know, the managing director and the technical director. Um, until then, I think we're very keen uh, to ensure that um, um, the existing uh, roles are continued, essentially are fulfilled by the, con the, the same actors that are in their function at the moment. And indeed, we've been reaching out bilaterally to key individuals and key organizations to ensure that's the case and to reassure them that um, you know, funding will be available from GFTT if necessary in order to sustain their position. I think that's the last slide, Katie. So let me just move on. It is. and. Um, I understand that we'll be answering questions at the end, so let me pass it back to Bernard. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you so much for, for keeping to absolutely spot on. Uh, thank you. Just to remind uh, participants that uh, to, for questions, please use the slido.com to pose your questions, uh, uh, which we'll take, as Martin has said, at the end of the, of the presentations. So we'll move on to the next uh, presentation, which will be uh, by Dr. Eric Stanard. Eric has an expert knowledge of HDM4 and is a visiting lecturer at the University of Birmingham. 
Eric is also currently the chief executive of uh, HDM Global, which is currently responsible for management of HDM for under a concession arrangements with uh, the World Road Association, Kayak. Eric will speak on approaches for improving climate issues into HDM4. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Have the first slide. So my, my talk is just going to build on what Martin has, has just said. Um, introduce some ideas of, of how HDM4 is currently being used to address some of these climate issues and suggest some ways that uh, we can improve that going forwards. Uh, and, and in some respects, it will introduce some ideas that will be expanded upon by the talkers that will uh, follow uh, myself. So if we just move on to the next slide. So HGM4 is a decision support tool and it's the development of previous tools which date back to the 1960s as, as was previously mentioned. Um, the last major update of the analytical framework and the technical models took place over uh, 20 years ago. Um, despite the age of the models, HGM4 remains today a well-respected piece of software. Uh, it's widely used all around the world. Um, and in fact, our latest figures say that we've actually sold the software into 120 different countries. Um, so uh, you know, quite a worldwide piece of software. Um, and, and that's typically used to perform these technical and economic appraisals of road investment projects, as well as the network and strategic level analyses that were previously mentioned. It's used by governments, development banks, road agencies, maintenance contractors, uh, and universities as well. So it has a, a large breakdown uh, of users. So typically HGM4 has been used to help organizations make decisions on road investments, um, trying to meet a, a given road standard for a minimized cost, uh, for determining the economic return on their road investments. But more recently, it's become more important to include uh, elements of the climate resilience of that network into the analysis and also to understand how the road network will impact on the production of greenhouse, greenhouse gases. Next slide please. So we, we know that climate change is having an impact on the performance of road networks and it will continue to, to do so in the future um, and, and this is mainly due to, to the, the impacts of higher temperatures, increased volumes and increased intensity of rainfall um, that, that's occurring and damaging the road. Uh, and, and this also brings about uh, an increase in the extreme weather events that, that are happening. And that can result in flooding uh, and land slides, which have an impact on our road networks. Uh, and we'll also predicting that in the future with sea level rises there'll be an increase in erosion and flooding especially of those networks that are close to, to those areas. So when performing an analysis using HGM4 we need to take account of these factors um, so that we have a full life cycle understanding of the road network's performance uh, under these climatic changes and we can predict what the maintenance needs are in the future uh, as a result of, of these uh, changing parameters. Next slide, please. So the current models in HCM4 were developed really before climate change was, was as high on the agenda um, is, is it, as it is now. Uh, and due to this, the current models have some restrictions. But if we're going to use HCM4 today, uh, we need to overcome some of these restrictions. Um, so, so that we can uh, address some of those issues. And we, we heard Martin say some of the external tools that the World Bank uses and brings those results back into to HDM4. So, um, you know, although it's not ideal to, to have these workarounds, we can use HDM4 to give us uh, uh, some indication uh, of uh, how the climate is going to impact our road network. 
So one of the limitations currently is that HCM4 assumes a, have a fixed climate throughout the analysis. Um, so we're, we're not assuming that the temperature is increasing year on year, rainfall and intensities. Um, we're actually just using an average value for the rainfall and the temperature. Um, and, and these don't capture some of the impacts uh, that are predicted on our network due to uh, higher rainfall intensities and some of these extreme weather events such as heat waves uh, and flooding. HCM4 um, also just focuses on the uh, pavement itself. We don't model the off carriageway structures uh, which can be important, especially in the face of yeah, increased rainfall. Um, uh, so it's important that we take into account the, the management of these off carriageway facilities that help to drain the water away from the roads. Uh, and we should be looking to include those costs for maintaining those facilities as part of managing our network so that they're not forgotten. Um, and that's di not directly included uh, within HDM4 at the moment. HDM4 also has a fixed range of pavement types and with default deterioration curves attached to them. Uh, and these are based on the previous research and field trials uh, that, that were done uh, some time ago. So typically these pavement types don't include some of the impacts that are seen from the climate change factors um, that, are, that are being predicted. Uh, and so we need to uh, consider that when we're using HDM4 today. Uh, also, we're seeing new pavement materials are being used throughout the world. Um, and, and especially looking at using some recycled materials into the mixes of, of the asphalt that's used. And we need to be able to model the impact of these new materials uh, on the uh, deterioration and maintenance needs in, into the future. So HDM4 is a, a, a tool which has quite a high degree of flexibility uh, within it. So it is possible to do, overcome some of these limitations, um, but it's not always ideal to always use workarounds. And it does require a more advanced knowledge of HDM4 uh, to be able to implement some of these workarounds. Uh, we know from uh, our, our technical support and, and some of the projects that we get involved with that many people are still only using the default values within HDM4, that they don't actually calibrate for their local conditions. So to ask them to use more advanced techniques within HDM4 um, you know, is, is going to require uh, some work. So rather than rely on workarounds, you know, part of this initiative is to look at how we can include and improve the existing models uh, and uh, drive the correct use of them in, in the future uh, with these initiatives um, that, that we have. So you can go to the next slide. So the current software uh, is, is very flexible and we have within this model uh, ways of calibrating the models and we can use the calibration to implement some of the impacts that we receive for climate change uh, on that, that road deterioration. Uh, another uh, strategy that's often used is adjusting the pavement strength to take account of the impact that changes in the rainfall and, and heat waves will have on the strength of the pavement and then that will be impacted in our modelling. Uh, and because HGM4 has a fixed climate model, um, we can also uh, do a two or three stage process when modeling to take account of the climate change over time. Next slide. So th th this is my last slide and we're just looking at some of the things that we may wish to change. So we want to be looking at the climate changes and the changes that will be need to be made to the road deterioration models uh, to include uh, impacts of, of this uh, climate change parameters. We want to look at introducing a framework so that we can include these new pavement materials um, that are now being used that are more resilient to the impact of, of climate change. Um, and uh, we want to look at 
being able to estimate the total greenhouse gases that will result from the road network. Whereas HDM4 currently considers the tailpipe emissions, what we want to do is to look at the road construction costs, the vehicle manufacture costs, the fuel production and delivery costs, uh, as well as the improvements in the vehicle uh, technology, such as uh, electric vehicles and uh, hybrid vehicles. And hopefully through this funding, uh, we will be able to implement some of these changes to make HCM4 the, a, a more rounded tool for the uh, addressing the climate issues that we're facing today. Thank you, Bernard. Super. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, again, spot on time. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, which is Michael Anyala. Michael is a road asset management specialist with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, Michael works on road asset management, as the title implies. Michael, like the previous speaker, uh, has a, a doctorate from the University of Birmingham. Michael will speak on HDM4 Road Decarbonisation Toolkit. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, uh, Bernard. So let me just start by saying that um, the Asian Development Bank has committed um, ourselves to um, ensuring that all our non-sovereign operations are aligned to the goals of the Paris Agreement by July of 2023. And then by July of 2025, all our sovereign operations should be fully aligned um, as well. So this road decommission toolkit that I will discuss today is part of a wider effort within the ADB to develop tools, guidance, and methodologies that will inform our approach to how we will support our client countries to decarbonize. Next slide, please. Right, so there are many sources of emissions uh, from, from road, as you can see there. So emissions uh, from the inputs uh, to works, which can be from the raw materials um, for construction. And then these raw materials need to be hauled uh, to batching plants, to then to the production. Um, and then from there, they have to be taken obviously um, to site uh, for laying. So all that process um, involves um, elements of emissions um, um, that needs to be taken into account. Um, and then from there, the next step is obviously the construction of the works. And again, at all stages of the life cycle of the road, from the construction to the maintenance to the periodic maintenance and reconstruction, uh, the process of actually doing the works itself also uh, results in um, greenhouse gas emissions. So that needs to be considered. Then from the vehicle side, um, um, most vehicles at the moment are, of course, internal combustion um, engine vehicles. Um, so the sources of emission includes you know, the oil production. So when the oils are being produced, again, that process requires, um, produces emissions. And then there's a transportation of that oil then to the refineries um, and then to the farms. And then, of course, then the vehicles themselves that will utilize the oil, of course, then uh, produces emissions. And of course, then they manufacture the vehicle themselves. So the process of manufacturing the vehicles requires energy, which is again also emitting. Now, when you look at electric vehicles, we have got to consider what will be the source of energy for charging these electric vehicles. Um, and to what extent are they green? So essentially looking at the grid factors um, that occur uh, within countries. Next slide, please. So why did we aim to then use um, HDM4 as a basis for this road decarbonization toolkit? So firstly, um, 
HDM already includes model for estimating tailpipe emissions. It also provides for a very uh, robust framework. Um, it is well understood as a good level of integrity. And then we also hope that the approach like the one that the ADB um, is developing could, be, could then be implemented within the HDM4 model. Next, please. Right, so next, if you click next. So if I just go through the steps to just explain briefly on how this determination toolkit works. So in the uh, works aspect of emissions, um, the toolkit would assume a constant, say for a, a region or a country on the uh, kind of like emissions that would happen, uh, would be embedded within the raw materials uh, within the regional country. Next. Then during the construction, essentially it utilizes the outputs from HDM4. So when you set up your HDM4 analysis and you run it, it produces uh, a works program and various other outputs. Um, in this case, an example showing uh, works in square meters per year. So what the tool then does is takes that and then applies um, units associated with each type of work uh, to calculate uh, the emissions for particular types of works. Next. Then for vehicles, um, it is really important to consider the upstream emission. So this is um, you know, the emission from the production of oil. Um, so the well to, to tank emission essentially. Uh, so what we do is uh, for this, based on informational literature, we factor up the, um, the tailpipe emissions um, to try and arrive at a reasonable estimate of what will be this upstream emission. And we think that a factor of around 1.3 um, is, is, is reasonable based on informational literature. Next. Then HDM4, of course, um, already has very robust models for estimating uh, tailpipe emissions. Um, so, so that's what HDM4 can do at the moment. Next. Then of course, if we really need to decarbonize uh, to net zero, uh, essentially we'll have to transition uh, into electric mobility. Um, this will require then consideration of the energy sources um, for charging uh, uh, electric vehicles. And this varies on a country by country basis. So for this, the toolkit considers grid factors and then uses that as a basis to estimate um, the energy consumption and then of course the emissions uh, that results uh, for with the charging of uh, electric vehicles. Next. And then it considers as well the um, requirements uh, for actually making this vehicle. So whether it is electric vehicle or an IC vehicle, Again, there are some um, emissions involved. So all, all that is embedded. And therefore it's kind of like a life cycle approach to uh, ensuring that all or most of the, the key sources of emissions are included within the toolkit. Next. So just to illustrate the way that this toolkit works. So you'd have to run HDM4, um, set up your analysis within HDM4 as usual, um, with the scenario you like to analyze. So whether it is a strategy analysis program or project, then run it. And then the toolkit then will import um, the data. So it, it takes the data from the run data and then produces outputs um, of the emission estimates and also other outputs like economic analysis. Next. Right, so where we are now with this toolkit is that um, we are at the piloting phase. So we're piloting this on six projects um, that are being prepared as well as those that are, those that are already ongoing uh, to see how this, this works. And the initial findings are very encouraging. Uh, so for example, um, we see what we expect. So if you actually maintain your road network well, you know, provide preventive maintenance or reactive maintenance uh, treat portals at the right time, 
the results show that you, you can get some uh, decrease uh, in emissions. As well as, of course, um, um, if you um, maintain the road well, fuel consumptions can become lower if speeds are constant. Uh, the use of cleaner fuels, of course, um, uh, reduces emissions. So all, all of those uh, seems to, to, to work quite well. So in addition also, of course, ATM4 has a very robust speed model. Um, again, you know, we take the advantage of that to demonstrate that you can test policies around demand management, for example, to say if you manage your network um, and operate traffic flows at a certain window, um, you can obviously could have substantial reductions um, in emissions. Then there's also opportunity to look at transitions to say public transport. Uh, again, the framework is already very, very, very well set up in uh, HDM4 to do that. But that can be taken further by looking at how can we then transition into electric mobility? Um, uh, so by capturing you know, uh, the framework that I described earlier and then use, utilizing HDM4 code outset analysis. So the piloting phase, uh, we expect that um, we will finalize this by the end of the year and then around April of next year during the ADB transfer forum, we expect to launch um, this toolkit formally. Next. So just to then conclude, um, addressing you know, road transport emission is critical to decarbonization, but I think the transition needs to be just. So we need to be able to address other pressing issues in transport sector as well. So in Asia, for example, 60% um, of road deaths in the world occur in Asia, so it's a very important issue to address. Um, road infrastructure gap is still very high, um, as well as uh, rural access is also a big problem. Over 600 million people are without rural access. So having an upgraded tool like HDM4 that addresses these issues will be very useful for uh, policy support. Next. So those are just some of the knowledge base um, that will be used, that people can use to actually op operationalize the toolkit. We are writing um, a paper on how this topic works, and this will be published also very soon. Next. And I think that's all. So thank you so much, and why not back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, that's super. Uh, I'll move on to the next speaker, uh, which is John Hind. John will speak on outstanding issues in HDM4, the implications of electric vehicles, vehicle maintenance, and wider economic benefits. John's a transport economist with over 50 years of experience on research, planning, and advice to uh, various organizations. John's worked in numerous, numerous transport research projects um, across the globe. Uh, previous employees include Transport Research Laboratory UK and, of course, the World Bank. John? Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. Good afternoon, morning, evening to everyone. Um, yes, as I'm going to talk about some of the outstanding issues, uh, you know, from my perspective. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Next slide. So the HDMM provides a really good opportunity to us to reevaluate what we want from a road planning model. And of course, there have been moves for, for a number of years to try and introduce carbon pricing into construction and road maintenance, and uh, recently into vehicle operating costs, you know, measuring the emissions and uh, what, what, the, what the carbon consequences of that would be. And, um, in, and in fact, these things have been uh, incorporated into the final net present values and IRRs of, uh, of um, you know, of, of HDM4. Um, that is to say that, you know, some of the, the, the costs and benefits can, can, that have been identified can then be, can be um, added in uh, of the, if you reduce emissions. 
so we also need to consider the variability of climate needs to be considered in road design and these things have been mentioned and i think tyrone will will talk more about more about this um, but we also need to think about new voc relationships and um the, you know particularly relating to electric and hydrogen vehicles um the vehicle operating cost component for many years, many of us have recognized, is perhaps the weakest link of the HDM models that have been used. The engineering models have been quite well uh, agreed and understood for many years, but there's been a weakness in, in this area. And we need to think about uh, probably a radical overhaul of the vehicle operating cost relationships relating to internal combustion engine models. The vehicle technologies, of course, have changed. Remember that much of the research on which HDM has been based is 30 and 40 years old. You know, this stuff is, um, is getting a little bit ancient. Um, and there's certainly evidence of cost over prediction, particularly on the default values. And this does have very important consequences. Um, and perhaps we should also consider how road investment affects development in a way that has not been incorporated in the model so far. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, so what's the impact of new vehicle technology? And it will have a profound effect. Electric vehicle prices are falling, battery capacity is rising, um, by 2025, new electric cars will be equivalent, the prices will be equivalent to their internal combustion engine counterparts. But there are major uncertainties about how heavy vehicles will develop. And heavy vehicles are critically important to HDM4 because most of the benefits that we, we, we estimate uh, re relate to, to heavy vehicles. Um, the fuel costs of electric cars and motorcycles are much lower than for internal combustion engine vehicles. Electric vehicles have high fuel efficiency and, em and emit less greenhouse gases. Um, and there's gonna be difference in the maintenance costs. Electric vehicles have far fewer moving parts, although difficult to be exact. Um, most authors agree maintenance costs are lower and that they could be as little as some estimates I've seen 30%, others 80%. Um, with an average at the moment, people talking about 50%, and this is for cars. We don't really know how it's going to work out over their lifetime. And of course, the maintenance cost depends upon the lifetime. Um, basically, what is, is very useful to, to, we haven't really talked about road roughness so far, but road roughness is the the critical variable, which is used in HDM4 to provide benefits, to provide user benefits. As you, as you reduce road roughness, you improve a road, you reduce road roughness, and as a result, you get benefits because you get lower vehicle operating costs. And a lot of that is to do with the maintenance costs of the vehicles. And this is, unfortunately, this is the topic which is really the most uncertain. Next slide. So the way HDM works at the moment is we forecast um, what the vehicle operating costs are going to be in the next 40, 30 years, up to 30 years. And we also know there's going to be a mix of vehicles and vehicle technologies on our roads as gradually internal combustion engine vehicles are phased out. We need to think about how to model the switch in vehicle types and how to incorporate this into HDM4. Lower vehicle operating costs for electric vehicles will always certainly mean lower estimated VOC benefits and less savings in greenhouse gas emissions from road investment for the same traffic. As I say, this is not good news for HDM4 practitioners. There is often huge pressure to come up with the right answer to justify the road investment. And I, I have met consultants who have been dismissed from their jobs because they couldn't make the road investment pay 
that, that they couldn't come up with nice positive answers that the client wants. Um, so, you know, there, there, there is an issue and HDM4 allows for detailed calibration. But what everybody does is basically we use the default values. We don't calibrate. There are some consultants who will calibrate, but most don't calibrate. And usually calibration means downwards. It means less benefits. And we need to think about this. We need to be honest with what we're doing. And uh, we, we need to have uh, some guarantee of, of really what we're, what, what we're doing and how we use the models. Okay, next slide. This was some research I did in Pakistan many years ago, and it shows what was predicted from two models at the time, HGM4 and HGM in Brazil and HGM in India, and actually what we observed. And that was from um, a two axle Japanese truck, and I've got this, the same for other things. The HGM4 um, Value, default value is actually lower than the two curves shown, a, 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 a bit lower, but still you can see there is a big gap. The next slide. And the same with a, a three axle truck, and you could do the same with a, a Bedford truck or with a, a, an articulated vehicle. So maintenance costs are really a big issue, and it's very easy to generate a lot of benefits using default values. And this is a worry for how we, we, we move forward. Okay, next slide. Should we consider wider economic benefits? The numerous rural road impact studies pointing to much greater benefits than would just be predicted from vehicle operating cost savings. And recently, growing interest in the wider economic benefits of road corridors. Um, wider economic benefits are defined in terms of not conventional transport cost savings that we use in HTM4. And in fact, the Department of, UK Department of Transport has even provided advice for appraisal on the issue of wide economic benefits. Next slide. You, this is the web of transport corridors in South Asia. This is produced by the World Bank and ADB and others. Uh, um, uh, you know, this report is 150 pages, so people are considering looking at that. The other slide is, uh, re relates to some work on the impact of rural roads. Rural roads have a big impact on rural communities, improving rural roads, and the benefits really are much higher than one would expect from looking at vehicle operating cost savings. Next slide. And this is an example of UK Department of Transport provides advice on how to incorporate wider economic benefits into an appraisal. And then some advice has been incorporated into different road projects. You can see in Leeds, Sheffield Urban, Bradford, and so on. And they measure conventional transport cost savings and then bring in additional benefits. Okay, next slide. What we purport to measure is exaggerated, but what we leave out is huge. So um, this is really, uh, I think my, my main message is um, we, we need to tidy up the whole problem of vehicle operating costs. And we also perhaps need to consider how we can look at wider economic benefits. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, John. Um, thank, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, move on to the next speaker uh, who will look at, who will talk about evaluating the life cycle impacts of climate and extreme events using HDM4 framework. The next speaker is Tyrone Tool, who joins us joins us from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I understand there's actually a bit of storming, perhaps climate change related in Melbourne at the moment. So there was some doubt whether Tyrone would join us, but I'm glad he's here with us. Tyrone joined the, the Australian Road Research Board in 2001, following a 20 year career with the UK Transport Research Laboratory. Um, 
Taron has contributed to the development of HDM4 over the years and has been really closely associated with its evolution. Tyrone, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. And as I said, it's lovely to see you again and uh, our other colleagues and friends. So I'll be different. I'll say hello from Australia. It's the good day, whatever time of day it is. Evening, night, morning, they say good day. I confuse them by saying good morning and, and other things. So really, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Bernard's introduced the overall scope of what I'll uh, touch on. It's uh, illustrative of the issues, challenges we face, and we know they're worsening. So the focus will be around resilience, looking at understanding or observing climate cycles, trends, and what might happen, uh, and uses a few case studies. And the evaluations we've been doing and to reflect what Eric was saying is actually adapting the framework, adapting the tools or uh, other supporting means. And what I've always learned from John is coming at it, uh, an analyst, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? Demonstrate the impacts, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, you know, do we understand the challenges? Uh, I've drawn on the work I've done with the road agencies here, as well as working in surrounding countries of Indonesia, et cetera, recently. Just have we changed our way of thinking? Are we actually noticing the short-term cycles, trends? Uh, have we taken notice at all? Have we actually recorded the magnitude, the duration, frequency of these disruptive events and not necessarily in, in some areas where you might have more benign conditions. Uh, again, it's, as Eric has said, but then how do, you, how do you evaluate these and what's their impact on performance? The other aspect uh, about all of this is yes, we're doing lots of analysis, but, and we're looking at the planning aspects, the road management aspects into the, the future, but we also have to recover from these events and an arm our uh, cadres of professionals, et cetera, with how to do that, to get communities, get industry uh, back working again. It can be extremely severe, we've seen it. So providing services to customers, people, goods, et cetera, moving them around, as John says, how do we capture that? Are we capturing it right at the moment? So the value of the services becomes absolutely paramount. We need to be able to spring back or perhaps a, it's, a, it's a short wait. If we've got high res resilient pavements, once the waters go down, you can get through in some cases. We've been seeing this with some of the more resilient technologies that have been applied uh, lately. Next slide, please. So the example, as I mentioned here, the land of fire and flood, a lot, a lot happens here. Even down in Southern Australia, Victoria, where I am. Uh, but what is it? Uh, the, the diagram here is showing these periods of El Nino, which is the more drier uh, climate cycles, the La Nina events are wetter, and the dark colors the blue reflects the, great, the highest on record, the deep blue. The deep red uh, reflects the driest uh, on record. So we've got these cycles. They're worsening, they're intensifying. Uh, you can see in the 2010 to 11 uh, examples, absolutely hammered uh, Queensland uh, as an example in other parts of the continent. In 2016, I think there was something like 15 or 16 major events uh, spread across, not just the coastal areas, but sucked right into the middle of the semi-arid and arid areas where, again, uh, planning in that wouldn't be accounting for these conditions in a normal sense. So extreme uh, conditions, uncertainty going forward or this massive variation, some of the things that we've identified is some of the issues fundamentally are also simple. Pavement failures are dominant. Uh, 
people drains are missing, they're blocked, they're inadequate, etc. So what can we do? So as we talk about off-road assets and not just what you see in front of your nose as you drive down the road, we need to be looking around the countryside as well as the uh, climate itself. How is it changing? Uh, what's happening through that? The other aspect is still many sections waiting to fail. We invested, I think, around $6 billion in that year or so. A 25% of the, of the network was uh, significantly repaired. That is massive. So one of the aspects we've been working with and, and the challenge going forward is what are the suitable treatments and where should they be placed? But you have to, have to understand all these conditions. Next slide, please. So again, what does it look like? Can you see here uh, in the dark, uh, properly uh, colors and blue, just how severe these, these uh, periods are, the, uh, the volume of rainfall with intensity, et cetera, has been enormous in this case in 2019. Vast swathes of the countryside uh, uh, flooded. We call it channel country up there where you've got much drier areas draining into the middle of the continent, you've actually got massive overland flows as well as it coming down from the sky. And it makes some of the southeastern areas extremely vulnerable. Townships is on the coast here, but where it's coming in uh, from the inland uh, rivers flowing, uh, flowing to the sea, et cetera, the ocean, vast, vast areas of uh, flooding. Up in the highlands and our hills uh, and the ranges, again, the moisture conditions, saturation of the slopes, etc., cetera, uh, and, and severance of access and that matters. We're very, very extensive. Next slide, please. In the work that we've been doing lately, I would say last five, 10 years, but we've also been drawing on a lot of historical work and uh, and in fact, it goes back to much of the similar work we've done around the world with TRL, et cetera. But what's been observed is the positions of standard uh, aspects, they don't sit at the same position in any year, the 500 millimeter ISO yet. It moves vastly uh, over a few years. And again, those design criteria we might have been considering become uh, inappropriate and we've perhaps not plan for it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, transition. And again, underlying this, we've got other things, black cotton soils, reactive clays. Transition, please. We've got these impacting it as well. So many of these variables we need to be able to better take into account in our, in our planning analysis. Next transition. Apologies on this, I thought I had removed the transitions. So vast differences from what we might otherwise apply is a more static model. So again, uh, what Eric's proposing and other areas like that very much will lead us to a better type of analysis. Next slide. So what does performance look like? Uh, next transition. And how does pavement strength change and how does the climate, et cetera, impact that? We can, from our knowledge, et cetera, see how the deterioration of strength might change over time. But what if we've got this switching in climate patterns and trends into the future? It becomes complicated, but it needs to be addressed. When we're looking at lower volume roads, et cetera, or even high, uh, standard roads, the strength changes significantly. And in the bottom corner of this slide, you'll see the differences in the road condition projection and hence the vehicle operating costs, perhaps access quality, et cetera. Next slide. So a resounding yes from me on really addressing this modeling of climate cycles and extremes. I spoke about the six billion 
the best for network approaches are very interesting. What we're seeing is there is a big bang for a buck if you get it right, then you can forecast uh, uh, what what happens. So major routes, development routes, we must do these differently. Uh, next slide, and I'll wrap up on the on the next slide. So John mentioned the next transition, uh, parts consumption, very, very important. We need to grasp that. Uh, next transition, please. And again, on life cycle greenhouse gas emission uh, assessments, as, uh, as alluded to by uh, Michael and explained by Michael. But the key is also better data and assessing uncertainty. So this whole business to undertake scenario analysis going forward, not keeping things constant should be a focus for the new model. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tyrone. That's excellent. Uh, I think that brings us to the uh, end of the presentations. Uh, we, we now have about 15 minutes or, or so for questions and answers. And if you have any questions, just to remind you that you do have the sales lead though, still questions. I'll move on to the first two questions uh, directed at uh, Martin Humphreys, Richard Martin Humphreys. Richard, the question is, does economic comparison of project alternatives also cover other modes? Does economic comparison of project alternatives also cover other modes? That's, that's directed to, to, to Richard Humphreys, um, um, but uh, other panelists may wish to make a comment following Richard's response. Okay, thanks Bernard. Um, the short answer is no. I mean, let's distinguish here between, you know, a planning tool that's used by a road authority um, to, to work out uh, how it's going to deliver a particular level of service or how it's going to undertake uh, and develop a, a, an annual or multi-annual uh, business plan in relation to its maintenance strategy or to do the appraisal of a particular project from uh, what we would see as the overarching feature, piece of work that we normally advocate in a client country, and that is, you know, a national transport master's plan and strategy. Uh, the latter would certainly look at issues of multimodality um, and would look at, you know, different options in relation to road sector vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, rail, inland waterway, coastal shipping, ideally, uh, and come up with a, an integrated plan, uh, ostensibly, that reflects the, the priorities of those modes. So that's your overarching framework, and then you drop down a level within each of the sectors and you do the business planning and uh, the HDM model essentially allows the road authority to do the, do the business planning in the road sector on the primary and secondary network. Let me pause there and hand it back to you. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, is there any other panelists to comment on that? If not, I'll move on to the next question, which is again directed at you, uh, uh, Martin, which is what is the usual rate of return for different road types and what externalities does it take into account? I'll just repeat, what is the usual rate of return for different road types and what externalities does it take into account? Um, in, in relation to the first question, uh, we had our um, independent evaluation group did a review of the transport portfolio over a 10 year period and the average internal rate of return for road transport projects, primary and secondary road transport projects was approximately 25 to 35% um, IIR. And, and that's you know, broadly uh, what we aspire to still um, within the institution, subject to some of the caveats that, that John raised obviously going forward and, and the issues of greater accessibility, wider economic benefits and, and health and employment issues. In terms of the externalities currently, it's primarily um, uh, road safety benefits um, brought in in a sort of end of tailpipe manner, as I discussed earlier. Um, and there's some consideration of, of greenhouse gases, 
but again, end of tailpipe based end of tailpipe manual, as I mentioned earlier, not certainly one of the central decision criteria within the model, uh, and that undoubtedly needs to change. I wouldn't say uh, some of the other issues like um, congestion, community severance, were handled particularly well within the model, if at all. Let me pause there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and feel free, any of the panelists, to comment as we go. But if not, we'll move on to the next question, to another question. Uh, this one, uh, perhaps directed at Michael. Uh, Michael, what about decommissioning, reuse, and recycling at the end of life? This is one of the aspects in life cycle analysis. Do you uh, like me to read? Yeah. No, no, absolutely, Bernard. So, really, very good question. So I didn't actually show that explicitly within the, the framework that I showed, but the modeling framework accounts for that. So basically you could consider decommissioning as being part of a works item that needs to, to happen. And then if you actually know what is the unit emission associated with that, um, that can then be, be modeled. But on, just on recycling, so this is really interesting. So one of the purposes of this tool for us is to promote what we call green infrastructure design and implementation. So we like you know things like using recycled materials to become standard practice because obviously uh, that's good for the environment, um, and therefore that's embedded as well within the framework. So essentially, if you know you know by being able to recycle a road, um, what would be um, you know the emissions related to that, which would obviously be lower than having to import new materials from long distances, um, then that can also be embedded within the framework. Uh, so it's a very versatile model. It's intended to be uh, kind of like a what if tool uh, to test you know, what, what can um, have impact um, on investment opportunities going forward. And that's the way that we see this should be used. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, move to another question. I, I suppose directed at uh, all the panelists, um, but uh, based on Martin's uh, presentation. So the question is, on the cases that Martin showed, is there a way to factor in embodied energy, uh, brackets CO2, in infrastructure works? Or is this insignificant in the bigger picture? Uh, and I guess that might touch on some of the work of, the, of, the, of, the, of, your, of your talk, Michael. So I'll just repeat the question. On the cases that Martin showed, is there a way to factor in embodied energy, that is CO2, in infrastructure works, or is this insignificant in the bigger scheme of things, big picture? Um, shall I go first, Bernard, and then I'm sure yes, others will come in? Go ahead, Martin, yes. Okay, I mean, very quickly, um, certainly work we've done suggests it's not, uh, certainly not insignificant. And, and, and needs to be considered. And I think Eric, if I'm not mistaken, mentioned, uh, and certainly Michael mentioned the importance of, of the upgrade, um, considering how to do this and, and how to reflect it in a, in a potential HDM5. And that's certainly something that we'll be looking at. I'll leave them to comment on this particular point in time, comment on the potential for how. Um, let me pause there and hand it over. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Eric. With apologies to Eric for dropping him. <laughs> no, no problem. Go, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, currently HDM4 calculates the the tailpipe emissions for the vehicles, um, so HDM4 has a good estimate uh, of the uh, impact of, of the vehicles using the network, but it doesn't currently calculate the emissions associated with the infrastructure. Um, and, and obviously there's, there's a need to do that to have this like life cycle understanding. Um, and, and this is what the toolkit that, that Michael is uh, working on is extending the functionality of HDM4 to uh, bring in these uh, infrastructure carbon costs uh, within the analysis. And, and you know, my, the toolkit that, that's being developed, um, you know, if it's successful, will you know, prove a, a good case study of how it can be done. And, and the World Bank are also doing similar things, I, I understand from um, what, what Martin said as well. So th there are ways to do it, but not currently within HTM4 uh, uh, directly. 
Yeah. Okay. But thank think... you very much, uh, uh, Eric. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Conscious, we've got time and we need to try and uh, cover as many questions. This one's directed at John. Uh, John, you mentioned that planners had to quit project for not delivering figures to justify road building. Is this pointing to a general policy bias? Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, you mentioned that planners had to quit projects for not delivering figures to justify road building. The question is, is this pointing to a general policy bias? Uh, basically, yes. Um, the Look, consultants are employed to produce, uh, to do a, an, an, an analysis, and the consultants, that there is pressure on them to come up with positive answers that the client wants. Um, I think we have to be realistic about that. Um, and, you know, there, there is, I believe there is a bias that uh, because of this overestimation of the vehicle operating cost savings from a, from a lot of a lot of the works going on. I don't want to rubbish HTM. I think HTM has done a huge amount of good, and the whole process um, of, of going through it and it's embedded in many organisations. It actually forces people to think of where the where the benefits are going to be, and um, it, it it actually has. The, the mere process of having the of having an HDM does uh, lead to better ranking of projects, and it also avoids the gross um, misspending of money. Uh, so the gross white elephants, which could have been uh, produced if we didn't have a planning model of this sort, have been avoided. But there is some bias involved. And I think we have to accept that. But the, my point is that we've been aware of this issue for many years, but also there is this other issue of the wider economic benefits. There are benefits that we're not capturing. And um, so, you know, there is there are pluses and minuses in how we go forward with this. Thank, 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 thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, Okay, I think that uh, that brings to an end the sort of the question time. I'd just like to thank everybody who attended this session. I think some of the figures that uh, Martin mentioned in terms of what the World Bank's doing with the, the number of projects, you know, something like twenty billion dollars worth of, of road projects appraised using HDM four. 18 billion over the next three years, which could be related. And that's just the, the, the World Bank group alone. And there are other MDBs and of course nationals who use HDM4 to appraise road projects. I think that underscores the importance um, of, uh, of using HDM uh, contribution to the decarbonization of transport and the significance of the multi-donor trust fund, which is now being uh, developed by the bank in collaboration with FCDO and, and ADB. So uh, a really important uh, session, a really important tool, and really good and important contribution to the, to the global effort on, carbon, on decarbonization of transport. So thank you very much, and uh, all have a good evening, good morning, and good night, wherever you are. Good evening.